Hallelujah. Go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Colossians, the first chapter. We'll be reading our, our foundation text once again. Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 1. Paul writing to the church at Colossae. Hallelujah. And we'll read the first through the... Um, oh... We'll read down to about there's 13 or 14, somewhere in there. 12. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And Timotheus, our brother, I like to say some, some things sometimes. You can't call yourself. Well, I think ministry is a good calling. Uh, you better be called. Amen. Amen. You better know that God called you. Because you don't want to be in the ministry if God didn't call you. Amen. And you don't want to win. You need to be sent. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Just saying. To the saints and faithful brethren. Who's he talking to? Christians. Amen. That's, that's right. And, and brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, <clears throat> grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof we heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it does also in you since the day ye heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. I've said this a couple of times. I'll say it again. Here Paul is saying that the gospel has been preached there as well as everywhere else in the world, and it has brought forth fruit. Not specifically saying that each individual is bearing the right amount of fruit. It's just saying that where the gospel's been preached, there has been fruit. Okay? In other words, he's speaking generally here. He's not speaking with uh, specifics about every single person at Faith and Victory Church is bringing forth fruit. We know that's not true. Don't we? You know, we're all at different stages. Some people aren't, aren't doing what they're supposed to. But it, the gospel's been preached here, and there has been fruit brought forth because of it. So he's speaking generally at this point. Hallelujah. And um, as we learn of Epirus, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who hath declared unto us your love in the Spirit, for this cause also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire. Stop. So Paul's making a statement here. We heard that you know, the gospel been preached. There's been fruit brought forth because of it. And because of that, and because we've seen the love of the Spirit, because you're, you know, there's been love manifest, we pray and desire for you. Now Paul's saying, this is our desire, and this is what we're praying for you. So we're calling, we're really saying this is the Paul, Paul's prayer for the church at Colossae. And we're making points out of his prayer because he pr you pray certain things for certain reasons. Right. Now if you're just out there speaking stuff out into the wind, it's not prayer. Amen. It's plant feeding. Amen. Some of y'all get that. The CO2 is coming out. You feed the plants, and that's the only thing that's happening. You know, there's some, you know, try to find something positive and everything. If you're just saying unbelief and you're just spouting out stuff and you're speaking stupid stuff, you know, the positive thing is the plants get fed. That's it. Because you're not going to get blessed by that. God doesn't honor uh, faithless prayers. Well, they're, not, they're not even prayer. They're usually, like we said Wednesday, complaining. All right, moving right along since you enjoyed that so much. This is Paul's prayer, that you be filled, uh, that you might be filled with all the knowledge of epinosis, that is a clear, precise, accurate, and experiential knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding, in other words, he prayed that they would have the, uh, that they would have the epinosis of God, but it would be in wisdom and spiritual understanding. Just a knowledge of the things of God is not enough. They have to be um, within the parameter of wisdom and spiritual understanding. You've seen people who, who got a lot of, you know, got a lot of, you know, spiritual, uh, not spiritual, but educational, theological training. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a guy, and I, I won't use his name, but he wrote a very, very extensive um, series of books uh, doing an exegesis of Scripture, doing nuggets, and, you know, uh, lots of, lots of uh, bypass in the Greek New Testament and, and stuff. A lot, a lot of really good Greek stuff. I mean, as far as studying from a natural and what the words mean and the shades of the meanings, there's a lot of good treasures there. But yet, he still calls the Christian the believing sinner. How can you have that much understanding? See, you can have knowledge and not have it in wisdom and spiritual understanding. In other words, you can give the exegesis of something and still not know what it means. Or have a full grasp of it. 
Okay, so the, the epinosis of God must be within the, the confines or the parameters of all wisdom and spiritual understanding for it to work and to make sense and be applicable to your life. Amen? So it's just not enough to get the knowledge of God. It's got to be tempered by wisdom and spiritual understanding. And so he says, you might be filled with the epinosis of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Amazing that in this day of, of, of radical hyper grace, that, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how you all, you know, to even say anything to anybody about about, you know, doing something as law and legalism, that Paul would write to the church, and he called, he called them brethren and fellow, uh, fellow brethren and saints, yeah. and tell them that he prayed they would walk worthy of the Lord. He did not say, because you're in the grace, you're already walking worthy of the Lord. He said, I'm praying for you that you would walk worthy of the Lord. And not only walk worthy, walk worthy unto all pleasing. Right. He tempered that statement or, or gave parameters to that statement, not just walking worthy, but worthy in a way that pleases the Lord. Amen. Amen. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the epinosis of God. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power and all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And we'll stop there. So last Sunday we began and started on talking about walking worthy of the Lord. And so the scripture, so we're going to go over, run over to second, um, um, first, second, first Thessalonians chapter two. Hallelujah. We're going to jump into 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we're going to read from 2 right on in down and get to chapter 4 because we're going to walk, we're going to, we're going to tie on where we left off last week. Here's where we left. This is the scripture we left off with. Walk, you know, walking worthy of the Lord. Then we're going to move into pleasing. Yeah. We want to be pleasing to the Father. Now we know, now the scripture says that without faith it's impossible to please him for they that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But let me say this, the walk of faith is not the only thing that pleases God. Amen. Now without it you can't, but it's not the only thing that pleases God. So we got to be, you know, sometimes we, we get our little pet scriptures and our pet doctrines and our pet, pet uh, view of scripture and we shove that into everything and you can't do it. Then you got, I remember back when my day, and I, I got saved in 79, ended up at the doors of Rama, uh, fall of 1980 and graduated 80, the spring, I only went the one year. So ours, ours was the last class you could go one year and quote, call it graduating. After that, you had to go two years. And, um, you know, so I show up there, and uh, back in my day, boy, you could get it, you just faith, you could do anything with faith. You could, I mean, and people, people believe in all kinds of stuff, and they were doing, super, believing the, the Lord's going to come. They're confessing the Lord's coming back on a certain day. And conf you can't confess the Lord's coming back on a certain day. Why? The Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. That's reserved in the hand of the Father. You can't declare that Jesus will be back on December 24th, 2012. I believe I receive it in the name of Jesus. It's done. Amen. No. Why? There's no basis for faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There's no scripture. Well, the Bible says that all things are possible to him that believeth. Understand, <coughs> well, you can't have my wife. You can't, you, you might, I believe I receive pastor's wife. I'll hurt you. Yeah. I'll just go to the Lord and I'll say, Lord, I know you said in the word that vengeance is mine. Say it, the Lord, I will repay. But I got this one. I will take you out. Well, I'm bigger than you. Rock. Shotgun. Actually, Nathan's got a seven mag. It'll drop a bear. It'll drop a deer. It will drop you. Guarantee it. All right. You can't have my wife. See, so all things are possible to him that believeth as long as they are lined up with the word. Yeah. As long as you have scripture that produces the faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If it is not word birth, it is not faith. Amen. Amen. So you go ahead and start, well, start confessing all kinds of stuff out there in the air. You're just, you're just feeding plants again. You're a plant feeder. I want to be more than a plant feeder. Amen. 
Amen? I want, I want to do things for God that accomplish things. I want to honor him and please him. And so we have to, we have to be careful about that. And see, and now they're doing this with the grace thing, you know. I mean, you know, because we're, we're under grace, we don't have to tithe. We don't have to give. We don't have to go to church. We don't have to submit. We don't have to obey. We don't have to. Well, there's all kinds of scriptures that tell you to do all those things. But they say, well, I'm under grace. I don't have to do any of it. You can't shove that into everything. And especially the, the interpretation they have on it. It's not that grace isn't involved in all things. It's the way they've interpreted the word and, their, and, and, the, and the, um, the mindset they have around it that they're shoving in. It's erroneous. Amen. Amen. The scriptures are given to us to disciple us, to train us, to grow us, to produce faith in us, but also to teach us how to live. Let me say this. We could have done a whole, we, we, could, we could have saved a lot of trees if Paul had just wrote to the church and said, you're under grace, it don't matter, you're going to heaven, see you there. John wouldn't have had to gotten boiled in oil. Peter wouldn't have had been crucified. Paul wouldn't have had to been, uh, you know, beheaded. He wouldn't have had to, and none of that stuff would have mattered. We had to do any of that stuff. They could have just all said, Lord, we're going on up now. We've written the letters to the church. Grace be unto you. You have it. You're going to heaven. See you there. End of story. But I find that the scriptures, even especially Paul's writings, are full of instruction to the church on how to live. It's full of it. Now, the grace of God empowers us, so we have empowering grace. The grace of God sustains us, so we have sustaining grace. We have strengthening grace. There's ministry grace. There's all kinds of grace. It's not all God's unmerited and undeserved favor. That is a that is a shallow. I'm going to tell you that is a shallow definition. And right, it's dangerous. It's dangerous because you should begin to take that and shove that into everything. And, it, and I'm going to tell you something. There's scriptures you read. If you go and take the word grace out and put God's unmerited, undeserved favor in, they make no sense. But if you put God's grace that strengthens you and then you, or, or God's grace that sustains you, all of a sudden that scripture makes sense. So we have to use the, param the, the, the context of things. Amen. So here Paul writes to the church at Colossae and says, I pray for you. That you walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. And let's go to First Thessalonians chapter twelve. I mean, chapter two, verse twelve. Now, but actually, I need to back up. Let's go to verse nine. For you remember, brethren, in our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly and unblamably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Look at how we lived holy, justly, and unblameable before you. He didn't say we lived in grace. He said, there's a, you look at our life. We lived a holy life. We lived a just life. We didn't have thing, anything you could charge us or be blamable against us with. Like I said, one pastor that I, that I oversee for Ramah um, uh, told me, he said a couple came into his church. Now, they weren't a married couple. They were a, a couple. And they, they were having relationship problems. They wanted counseling from the pastor. Got talked to them, found out they're living together. Unmarried. Fornication. And he said, we know the reason you're probably having problems in your relationship is you're living in sin. Oh, no, pastor, we're under grace. That don't matter. Yeah. <laughs> he said, well, I can't help you. And he's right. You can't help people who, who refuse to do what the Word says. Amen. All right. Verse 11. As you know, we all, how we exhorted and comforted and charged one of you. As a father doth his children, that ye would... Listen to this. Paul's saying, just like a father would charge his children. Just like I would tell Nathan, Nathan, don't do this. This is not good for you. And I do that, don't I, son? You know? I'll say, I'll say you don't do this. This is not... You know, and it's not that he's done it. I tell him ahead of time. These are things you don't do. They will hurt you in the long run. As a father does his children. Why? Because I love my son. I told my girls the same things. We love our children. And we're, I'm their father to my children. And because of my wisdom and experience in life, I know things that will be harmful and detrimental and destructive to your life. And so I charge you don't do them. Amen. Not because I don't want you to have fun, but because it could hurt you. Amen. Amen. And Paul said, I have written unto you as a father does his children. 
What did he write to them? That you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because you received the word of God, and you heard it of us. You received it not as the word of men, but as it in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which are in Judea, or in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered light things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews." who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to the, all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved and filled and fill up their sins away, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, I'm going to read all the way down to verse chapter 4, so just hang with me. <clears throat> being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoring the more abundantly to see your face with great desire, whereof we would have come unto you, see, even I, Paul, once again, but Satan hindered us. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We, see, we got over the confession so much, we couldn't say, Satan hindered me. Paul says Satan hindered him. That's not the devil. I don't, I, I, you know, see, you, we got, actually, we got over the Christian science a little bit with some of our confession. See, a lot of Christians, what Christian science says, it denies the natural is real. And we got a lot of Christians who call, called it confession who were simply practicing Christian science. They were denying something instead of confessing what, what, uh, the, the, the Word of God about it. And we never say, oh, you can't say that Satan's hindering you. Well, Paul said he did. Now, you don't run around all day long, Satan hindered me, Satan hindered me, Satan hindered me, but he, uh, he hindered us. They had to do something about that. Amen? Sometimes, look, you got to recognize what the problem is to deal with it. For what is our hope or joy or crown or rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at this coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left to Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. That no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto for verily when we were with you we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it even as it came to pass and you know now i'm going to tell you something else a lot of things we used to do under faith and say that you know we that hey we address this and addressed it and addressed it and people just act like a cow in a new gate and i mean like a uh, what he said a bullfrog in a west texas hailstorm they just act like he didn't even say it he said some people get the idea that living by faith means you're going through life on flowery beds of ease you're not going to have any trouble, you're not going to have any challenges, you're not going to have to deal with anything in life, and that's just going to get you in trouble. We're told to fight the good fight of faith. Now, how many believe Paul walked by faith? How many of you ever read the passage of Scripture where he says, I was in travailings often, and thirstings often, and fastings often, I was let down over the wall, I was stoned, I was whipped, I'm done. he just goes on and on and on. How many remember reading that? Amen. But he was a man of faith. But he suffered persecution. They that live godly will suffer persecution. Right. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Five. Yeah, for this cause I would no longer forbear. I sent to you, uh, sent to know your faith, lest by some means a tempter had tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now, when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and love, and we have a good remembrance of you always of, of us. I'm sorry, and you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, <coughs> if ye stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can be rendered to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith uh, we joy for your sakes before God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God... And Again, I keep hitting this, but this is, this is swept through the church so much. People are bought into stuff. Why would Paul have to do something that's lacking, help them in the lacking of their faith if grace took care of everything? And all they had to do was sit back and look at the finished work of Jesus and never do anything. I want to see you so I can help in the arena where you're lacking in faith. Why? Because we grow. Don't ever think, listen, don't ever think <clears throat> because you, get, you, get, you got a good message or you, did so, you got a, one blessing that you got to stop growing. 
But you have to stop learning. You have to stop feeding. You have to stop spending time with the Lord. You don't need to come to church anymore. All these things help in your growth. And they're, and they're sustainers for your life. Amen? Hallelujah. <clears throat> now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as you, uh, we do toward you, to the end that we may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. I, <laughs> I love this. I'm already holy. Well, he wants to establish your hearts in holiness. Before God, even our Father, at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all saints. Furthermore, it's not a new, listen, this is not a whole new thought. Furthermore means carrying on from where we just stated. In other words, I'm telling you something. And furthermore, in other words, there's more to it. Yeah. Listen to this next verse. This is where we, I was all, all that to get here. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God. Stop. Don't look. Paul has written to them and told them how they ought to walk and to please God. One of the things he said there is abstain from fornication. Did he not? I said, did he not? Yeah. Why do you keep hitting that? Have you noticed we got a sex crazed society? You can't turn on a movie anymore, anywhere, they don't have a homo in it. Come on now. Listen, I'm not, listen, I'm, I'm, listen, I'm, I, I'm tired of being told that's the, they got a new show out called The New Norm. And one of the parts of The New Norm is a homosexual in there. Hello? Then they, then they brought that cougar show back. Every time I, I mean, it's coming back in the fall on TBS, they got canceled on the network, and now TBS is bringing it back. Every time you watch TBS, you know, we're back, we're back, you know, and you got, and it's, like, it's all about old women going after young men. Just go find somebody your own age, honey, and get married. Stop, stop dating 40 years younger than you. Now, I'm not talking, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a difference in some places, but when you're 30, 40 years difference, there's a problem. You're 60 and they're, they're 28. But that shows all about that. You know, this is crazy. It's, it's, you know what it is? It is a reversal of all these old men going after, you know, you have to going after the 18-year-olds. Hello? And, you know, the world mindset is, is, is all about, you know, everybody getting what they're due. Everybody getting what's, what's, what's theirs. You know, come on, people. We're so sex crazed that you can't, you can't do anything. Our television is just full of every kind of perverse. And, and listen, you understand that, that one show I was just talking about. It's, I mean, these, these really old women going after these, these young guys because they can't keep up with their husband or something. Help me, Lord. I'm just, I'm just tired of the sexual connotations and all the sexual junk that's shoved out there everywhere. Amen. Amen. That we just shoved out there all the time. And people have to deal with it all the time. And people just always, you know, got to have homosexuality, got to have lesbianism, got to have three people living with one guy. You know, and all, I'll just, I mean, actually that, that show, I tell you what really bugs about that show is it's all about living in sin. But then, you know, they got the two cougars with the one guy in bed together on the commercial. Just in the commercial. What's wrong with people? Somebody talk to me. I said, what's wrong with people? Y'all are so exciting out there. He said, abstain from fornication. He said a bunch of other stuff. And then he comes over here and says, I, I beseech you that, exhort you that by the Lord Jesus, that you as you received us, you ought to walk and to please God. We ought to walk and please God. Listen, what, and this is what he says. When you walk and please, so you would abound more and more. Do not tell me honoring the Lord does not have something to do with how you abound. Hello? 
Paul said, I want you to walk, I taught you to walk, and to please God so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandment we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. This is the next verse. Hallelujah. Praise God. There, here he is. That you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lust of con I love this word, concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Then he goes on, that, you would, uh, that no man would go beyond and defraud his brother in any way, because the Lord is an avenger of such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but uh, uncleanliness, but unto holiness. Wow. If we're going to walk, please, you know, listen folks, this, this is a matter of applying to your life the inner workings of the Spirit and living it. Don't ever think what you do with your flesh. You can't go out and party hardy and expect... That's the one thing that the church at Rome I always had a problem with. Let's get drunk on Saturday and make confession on Sunday. Holy Father, forgive me for I have sinned. What did you do? I got drunk last night and slept with four men. Do 400 Hail Marys and three rosaries. Hail Mary, Mother of God, you full of mercy and grace, da 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 da, da. You know, do the rosaries, all right, and I'm forgiven. And you go out and do it all the next week and then go back to the Father on Sunday. Or Saturday night math. I mean, if it's been really bad, you do it on Saturday night. Run in real quick and you get, get absolved before you, before you run go to bed. Because, you know, you, you, there's a, that's a mindset. Yet the Word of God says that we're to walk unto pleasing. We're to, we're, how we're out to walk and to please God. And, amen. Why? Because you will abound more and more. How we live affects what blessings we walk in. You don't, don't think. Don't think you can be ripping people off blind and the Lord's going to bless you. Amen. Oh, God's going to bless me. You know, hey, I just stole $400 from the guy. That I picked his pocket, got his credit card, ran out there and, burnt and, 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 and cash advanced it, got $400. Oh, the blessing of the Lord. No, it ain't. Unless you're talking about Beelzebub. Bub. Bub. Come on. Amen. How we live is indicative of what we're letting come out of us. And, I, and Paul said that right here in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that if we walk towards the way we're supposed to walk, as pleasing to the Lord, it would, it's, a, it's in relationship to how we abound. You can't confess your abundance and live in sin. And expect it to work. Amen. You're wrong. Amen. You're in error. Amen. You can't be confessing the blessing of the Lord and using the F bomb in the next sentence and think it's going to work. Amen. Come on now. Amen. I want, I, I want you get on Facebook, you see people, they're dropping the F bomb right left, and then they come to church. What in the world is wrong with you? I have sit in my office and cuss. And I'm talking about people who've been in this church, not just visitors. Get mad and cuss. But the Lord's showing them all kinds of revelation. I'm sorry. I have a hard time with your revelation because of the things you're saying when you're not getting revelation. Hello. Come and tell me the Lord showed me this, the Lord showed me that, and then, then the week before you were saying they're an SOB and I mean cussing and then you know and, and I mean I'm sorry. Hey, one person come to the church for a little while. They wanted to do some stuff in the church and I couldn't let them do things in the church. They try to talk to me and they start cussing. They say, Pardon my French, I'm thinking that's not French. That's plain English. I understood that. I don't, understand, I don't know any French cuss words, but I, I know that one. That was an English cuss word. 
We want to help. We want to come in church and help you. Blankety blank. <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> It don't matter what I say, the Lord loves. Well, the Lord, yeah, the Lord does love you, but it does matter what you say. Amen. It matters how you live. Yeah. It matters what you do. You have a testimony. Amen. And Paul referred to his own testimony in this passage, saying, You've noticed how holily and justly and, and um, unblameably we lived. He used that for a, an authoritative, a, a, um, What's up, Bill? I'm looking, I'm looking for the word. <laughs> for a hmm, reference to his authority. I'm looking for that word. It's not, it's not reference. It's something else. Condone. He condoned his authority by how he lived. He gave his credentials of how he lived as a reference to or a approval of his authority. Think about it now. He didn't say, just like you, I'm under grace and I'm saying these things. He said, you've seen how I lived? Yeah. Yeah. You've seen how I conducted myself? Yeah. Amen. And these things are the reason I'm, I'm able to say what I'm saying to you. That's kind of what he said. You don't carry authority with people acting like them. Hey, we're going to win the sin unless we're going to jump a Bud Light long neck together. Hey, that's the coolest preacher I ever seen. He drinks with us. I'm not sent to drink with you. I'm sent to deliver you. I'm not sent to be like you. I'm sent to help you come and become a part of the body of Christ. Now, it's one thing, you know, to eat and drink. With, you know, I can go sit down and have a meal with somebody, but I don't mean I have to get drunk and shoot up and smoke dope with them. I'm the dope smoking pastor. Don't worry about a thing. Every little thing going to be all right. You need Jesus, dude. Woke up this morning. Hey, Ed Marley. What was that, son? <laughs> you don't. I don't want to know. All right. Yeah, we're going to win the Rostos by smoking dope with them. No, you're not. You're, all you're going to do is you're going to disapprove yourself as an authority to them. You're not going to be able to speak with authority from the Scriptures. See, there's a new mindset in the body of Christ. And I'm telling you, we're seeing after 20, 20 plus years of this teaching going on in the church of, you know, secret sensitive, you know, I mean, water everything down. Don't tell people they got to repent. Don't tell people, don't tell people they're wrong. Don't tell people they're unsaved. Don't tell people that they've rebelled against God. Just, you know, have a rock climbing wall and a really cool rock and worship with smoke show and light shows. And I mean, it's a performance. Everybody shows up for the performance. Why don't we just get Travolta out there? Ding, 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 ding. Woo! We had church today. They were, they were doing Saturday Night Live on the dance floor at the church. And then I'm brought back to the command of the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he told them to go tell people to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He didn't say invite them or we're trying to win young people. By being and giving them exactly what they already have just inside a church building. You think simply by moving them off the streets into the building that's going to make a difference in life? Are they, oh, this is cool. I can, I can serve Jesus and, and be like this. Smoke some dope, have some weed, shoot up a little bit, drop some acid, have out of body experiences with the Lord. And they don't even tell me I'm wrong. They don't even tell me I'm a sinner. They hadn't told me that I need to repent. They, you know, the church doesn't know anything anymore. We're to live a lifestyle that honors God. And here's what happens when you water it down, people in the church begin to act. What happens? They go to the lowest common denominator. Now the church, listen. 
I, I, I ain't got no problem you go out and set up a stage somewhere and you have some, you know, cool Christian rock or whatever to draw a crowd, but then you preach Jesus to them. Amen. But what's the problem is we brought it to the church and made the church that. And they're not even preaching Jesus. Amen. They're telling them that, you know, that you're fine just like you are. Come on in. Join this group. Join that group. Join this connection group. Da, 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 da. Oh, we got 3,000 people in our building. Yeah, but what was it? What, have, are you, have, you, have they been saved? Are you telling them that they got to walk worthy of pleasing the Lord? There has to be a change in their life. I'm telling you, man, when I came out of the world and came into Jesus Christ, it was a radical experience and change for me. The way I lived before, I didn't want to live that way anymore. They didn't try to keep me as close to the world so I wouldn't, so I would keep coming to their building. We do the church and we do people disservice when we tell you that you can be just like you were. Amen. And keep living that way. Now I understand that one guy, one person came to minister one time and said, you know, I would get saved, but I love to dance. And they said, well, once you get saved, you can dance all you want to. Well, they went and got saved. They came back a week later and said, I understand what you mean. They said, what? He said, once I got saved, that the want to was gone. They knew that. And so they, they, that's fine. But you don't get up in the pulpit each week and say, look, guys, go on out there and drink some bud, smoke some dope. As long as you come here on Sundays, we do, we're happy with it. You know, you don't have to change. I am telling you, Paul wrote to the church and said, I'm praying for you that you would walk worthy of the Lord. Unto all pleasing. And then he says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, so that ye abound more and more. Paul linked the life of abundance to walking pleasing to the Lord. Well, that's works. It's not works. It's living out Christ in your life. It's letting Christ manifest in your life. It's a demonstration of the reality of the change that's taking place in your life. All right, can I sit it real straight? Smack, smack, smack. Now wake up. Just wake up. I'm not preaching mean. I'm not preaching hate. I'm telling you people, it's wrong to tell people when they've come into the kingdom that there don't need to be, there, there don't need to be changes and manifestations of changes in their life. Now, the other side of that is the idiots used to, and, you know, well, if they got anything, they'll be back. No, you know, you're their babes. You help them with that seat. <clears throat> this is the problem. We don't know how to help babes grow. Amen. We think by keeping them babes, we're helping them. Now, how many, how many parents do we have in here? All right. How many people that have their parents in here, your children are over 10 years old? Raise your hand. How many of you want to change their diaper? Why? Just the image is bad, isn't it? You don't want to wipe their back in. You don't want to change it. You don't want them wearing diapers and you don't want to be changing them, do you? Anybody? I do not have a single hand on that issue. Why? You did it when they were a babe because, they, because as a babe, they couldn't fend for themselves. But what, are the, what is one of the first things you want to do for that rascal? <laughs> Potty, train them. Is that not right? You want them potty trained. We want, to, we want you to go to the potty. The loo. We want you to go to the loo. Hello? And let me tell you, if they're 10 years old and they're still using a diaper, got a problem. I'm going to say something else. I've heard this from people I know, Christians. You're taking showers with your children of the opposite. It's your children of but the opposite sex. You're, you're, they're 10, 11 years old. You're something wrong. You don't take, that's wrong. I'm their mother. That is sick. You got sex devils running around your house. I know, I know people. They don't not in our church anymore. I found that after they were gone from my church, but I'm like, really? And what kind of problems have you got? You know, some psychologists might write, don't, don't write, don't even bother. <laughs> you and your Freudism, I don't need. Thank you. Just, just, just go read your Freud books and stay sick. I don't want to hear it. It is not normal 
keep taking showers with your children when they're I mean schedule a shower time with your, with your 10 11 year old child there's something wrong with that how did I get off on that I don't know oh the diaper thing we all think that's weird don't we now if your child was foot 13 and walking in here with a diaper on what would you say you need to do something with that. That child needs to be potty trained for a lot of reasons. It's like what, what Bill Cosby used to say. Oh, look at the little diaper. They did the first poo poo. And then six months later, God put something there called odor. Oh, my God! <laughs> yeah. Amen. Why am I saying all this? We come to the church. And we keep them on the bottle and in diapers. And we keep telling them it's okay. And they're saved five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. And we're keeping them in diapers. And calling it sensitive. They need to grow up. They need to be told that this behavior as a Christian is not right. Hello? You don't need earlobes big enough that you can drive a, tie, a car through. Somebody go under the gauges. Does that, does that freak anybody out when you go see somebody and they got, they got a hole that big in their ear their earlobe there? You know? And they got that ring in it. And then you can say, I can stick my hand through that. I mean, sometimes like you think, I want to stick my finger through there just, just, to, just to aggravate them. Just, I think it. Never done it. Maybe I'll stick my VIP card in there. Just stick it and see if it'll fit. And leave it with them. I'm messing. It is wrong for the church to tell people you can stay a babe and you don't need to grow up. When the Word of God says we need to teach you, you need to walk worthy of pleasing the Lord. Because how you walk and how you please the Lord is in direct correlation to how you're going to get blessed. Well, I'm blessed because I'm under grace. Well, Paul said that when you walk pleasing the Lord, when you walk worthy of the Lord and you please Him, you will abound more and more. Now, I can't, you know, maybe you got some kind of new Bible, but that's what Paul said. And he is the preacher of grace. And then he went into this. He went and messed up everything and gave a command. I love that. Because you've got people saying, no, there are no commandments. We're free. Well, Paul said, you know the command of the Lord. Amen? <laughs> it's the command of love we, that we gave you by the Lord Jesus. And then he goes on and says this, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And they, Why did he pick this one? That you should abstain from fornication. Because so many people are consumed with sexual sin. You're going to have to clean up your act church if you're in here or on the internet wherever you are you got you're gonna have to stop doing some stuff if you want to be blessed god is not pleased with sin he's not pleased with sexual sin you don't honor the lord hello well, what if I've done something wrong? Repent. <clears throat> now, what does repent mean? Number one, you go to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. That's part of repentance. See, some people take that one definition and it means to go a different direction. Yeah, but you know, there's more to it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And 1 John 1, 9 was written to the church. I don't care what you say. Amen. Just, just get rid of that Bible that took it out. They got a new Bible out that, people, that somebody found. And First John 1, 8, 9, and 10 have been removed from the Scripture completely because somebody said they weren't written to the church. So they just took it out and printed the Bible. And people were buying that Bible. Oh, it's not in this Bible. But they start taking stuff out and I don't want that Bible. It's good for kindling. Because the Bible, because God said if you take stuff out or add stuff to it that, that was supposed to be there, you're a cursed anathemia. I don't want anathemia on me. What does it mean? I don't know exactly what it means, but I don't want it. Because it came right out the curse. So I'm, I'm kind of gathering that it's even worse than the curse. <laughs> okay? But whatever a nephew is, I don't want it. All right? Repentance is entailed in two things. The confession and the turning away from. 
Amen. Now, when you come into the kingdom, it's the confession of Jesus as your Lord, because you can't confess all your sins. The Bible never told the unbeliever to confess their sins. It told the unbeliever to confess Jesus as Lord. The New Testament teaches the believer that when they sin, they confess their sin. Anybody, I don't know how people can get that wrong. Only they have a narrative that they want to promote. They're just like the liberal media. They have a narrative they want to promote, and they just they skew it to say what they want it to say, no matter what. When you adopt a narrative, hello, when you adopt a narrative, that's the way it becomes. He said, so repentance is two things. For the believer, it is confession of the sin for, for, for the cleansing and turning away from. You stop doing it. You don't keep doing it. You stop. You confess to the Lord, I sin. The Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And you turn away from it. You stop doing it. Simply turning away, is, that is not, that's not full repentance. Amen. Did you know the scripture says something real interesting? It says, godly sorrow worketh repentance. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? Godly sorrow worketh repentance. In other words, there is a sorrow that's not godly. What's that? I got caught. Yeah. I'm sorry. Why are you sorry? I got caught. If you hadn't caught me, I'd kept doing it. Then you're not godly sorrowful. You're worldly sorrowful. You're only sorry because you got caught. Godly sorrow works repentance. In other words, now, see, worldly sorrow is this. The first chance you get, you're going to do it again. I got caught this time. I'll do whatever I have to do so I can keep doing it and nobody find out about it. I'll, I'll, be more, in other words, I'll be more careful next time. That's worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow is you are convicted in heart by your own heart. If our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence toward God. Your heart condemns you that what you're doing is against God, against His Word. See, if you're going to walk pleasing of the Lord, you're going to have to let your heart speak and not let some money-grubbing preacher override your heart. Woo. I say stuff sometimes that you just, I just wonder. And it, it, well, you could have a bigger church if you didn't say some of this stuff. Then I'd be a money-grubbing preacher. <laughs> now, not that all church, but big churches are money-grubbing preachers. I'm talking about the ones who are preaching what people want to hear and not telling them what they need to hear in order to get the crowds in because, it gets, because they hear what they want to hear. Giving people what they want to hear. It's like giving, it's like, now listen, Nathan, now Nathan's not my real sweet kid now. Let me think of it. Jesse. Jesse is my sweets kid. Jesse used to take gummy bears and hide with them. Janie asked one time for a gummy bear and she wouldn't give it to her. She lost the whole package. She was a little guy. You know, that's it. I'm going to teach you a lesson. You're going to share because she loved gummy bears. She likes sugar. Now, Nathan, he likes salty sweet, buttery sweet. He don't like it sweet, sweet. You know, I mean, my idea of a dessert is chocolate cake with chocolate frosting with chocolate ice cream and, chocolate, and, and double Dutch chocolate milk. Uh, with a little real whipped cream on top. So it's not all chocolate. Yeah, chocolate whipped cream. Woo! But you take a child and all you ever feed them is sugar. They will be malnourished. You give them all the gummy bears and all the ice cream and all the sweets they want and they'll be malnourished. They won't be strong. They won't be healthy. They won't get the calcium. They won't get the protein. They won't get the things their body needs to grow and to develop properly. But we got a lot of people in, in the church today who want to give everybody sugar. And get them on a sugar high. A spiritual sugar high. And they're all excited. Let me tell you something. You give kids sugar and they will get excited. Especially if it has red dye number five in it. There'll be ping pong balls bouncing off the wall. Amen. Why? Because their, their body is, is, it hypes them up. And we're doing that in the church. We're hyping people up and telling them, you know, you just need the sugar. You just need the sugar. You don't need anything else. You just need sugar. That old mean mommy going to make you eat them green vegetables. Daddy take them out and buy them an ice cream cone. You think, why do they love daddy? Oh, give me an ice cream cone. Why do they love certain preachers? They just give me ice cream cones. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how you live. You just come on in. You're great here. 
How many have ever had, well, some of you got older kids now, your teenage kids start talking about how great so-and-so's mom or dad is? And you start doing a little investigating. And you find out what it is, is they let them do anything they want to do. Their kids get to do anything they want to do. They stay out at 3 o'clock in the morning. They're running up and down the road. They even give them a beer because they think they're old enough that as long as they're drinking at home, it's okay. And that's a cool bombing dad. And here you're left out to be the bad guy because you say you're coming in. You ain't running down the road at 3 o'clock in the morning. As a matter of fact, if you ain't got somewhere to be, you're home as soon as, you, as soon as you're done with school or baseball practice or football practice or whatever. You ain't running up and down the road. And if you are up and down the road, I'm going to know where you are, who you're with, and who you're talking to. And if you don't like that, you ain't going nowhere. I'll take your car away and I'll take your phone away. And I'll put a GPS tracker out while you're sleeping. I'll inject you with a GPS tracker. I'll find you. Nathan has one. His mama put it in him. I'm just messing. Come on. You're the meanie. No. You're the one training your child the right way. But there's, there's, there's consequences for bad mistakes, choices, that you need to do certain things if you're going to grow and develop and be a good person and the right kind of person you want to be. And there's, 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 there's parameters to life. But see, everybody loves the sugar daddy. Until their kids are killed in a car wreck driving drunk at 3 o'clock in the morning. Or they die from an overdose. Hello. And everybody goes, they're such wonderful people. How did that happen? Because you didn't follow sound child training principles is why. And we're doing that in the church. We're telling the kids, come on, I'm going to use a parallel. They can stay out and run wild. They can live in sin. It doesn't matter as long as you come here and think I'm wonderful. And then everybody wants to go over there. Why? Because everybody wants to live in their flesh. You know, you want to live in your flesh. Your flesh gets up and wants to be fleshly. Yeah. Anybody ever had your flesh want to be fleshly? Amen. Raise your hand. Because if you don't have your hand up, you're lying. Your flesh wants to be fleshly. So you go to the church that says, living in sin will hurt you. I don't like that church. Wow, they're in bondage. Let me tell you something. The person who's in true bondage is the person who has yielded their members unto, un, unto sin, unto unrighteousness. That is bondage. Because Paul wrote to the church and said, whoever you yield your members as servants to his, their servant, you are. And there's nothing more detrimental and nothing more destructive and nothing more evil than to have sin as your master. As Paul writes there in Romans, I believe, chapter 6, and says, if you yield your sin members as servants of, to sin and, and as unto unrighteousness, amen, you, 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 I'm going to paraphrase because I'm not going to quote all that. He says, I'm going to say it this way. If you yield it to sin, you yield it to death. If you live it, yield it to righteousness, you yield it to life. You may think the pastor is mean because he said we can't sin. We're under grace. And he didn't believe that. No, I'm not mean. I'm trying to keep you from coming the servant of sin unto death by living righteously unto life. And it's not all, you understand, it's not all an exercise in not doing stuff, but you're supposed to govern and control your flesh. And the people who tell you you don't, and the, if you, the people, and they tell you the people who tell you you have to are, you know, legalistic and bondage, no, 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 no. They've been used by the devil to bring you into bondage. The bondage of sin unto death under the guise of liberation. <clears throat> Just like people in elections who vote because they're going to get something free and they're going to have all this wonderful uh, whatever because they're free. 
There's a price for that freedom. It's called control of your life. The people in the Bolshevik Revolution overthrow a, a czar to get a communist government so they could at the, at, uh, live for the next 70 years under the domination of communism that told them what they were to be in life, where they were going to live in life, what they were going to do in life, where they could or could not travel in life, and they all thought they were getting free. The study of history. All the countries after World War II that joined with the Soviet Union because it was going to be, you know, free from the German advancements, found out that what they thought was going to be freedom was captivity and bondage. And we got people in the church stirring people up and telling them that by coming to a certain message, you know, the, this message of radical grace, and you, that, that anybody that tells you, you, you know, that, that you, you've got constraints and you can't do this and you can't do that, anybody that says those things to you, they're preaching legalism and bondage, they're preaching law. <coughs> people, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't want that. I'm free. I'm free from the law. And they run off and they all join, join together. And I know from a friend, from a very close friend, of a church that's near one of the largest proponents of this teaching in the world. And everybody in their church that's in sin, I mean, they're not church, in their Bible school. Everybody that's in their Bible school, they've had to remove from the Bible school, bring in for discipline for the Bible school, for living in sin, has been in this church. They're fornicating, they're drinking, they're doing all kinds of stuff, thinking they're free. You're bound. He said, you're bound. And Paul said, when you yield your members as servants of unrighteousness, you yield it to sin unto death. You bring destruction into your life under the guise of freedom. And people just popping the money out there, going to the churches, and buying the books. Woo, I'm free. I don't have to. You will, I, was, I was called by one of these people who got caught up with this stuff, the fruitless preacher of a two-faced gospel. What was my two face? We preach that you get saved, then you told us we had to do certain things. Well, you do. You're a fruitless preacher of a two faced gospel. They're all off on the, the lunatic side. It don't matter what I do. Don't even have to go to church. Wow, what freedom? You don't have to go to church. I say, what's wrong with you that you don't? Because if you love the Lord, you want to be with his people, you want to be in the house of God. I am the house of God. We did this a while back. We studied. There's places in the New Testament that refer to the building as the house of God and there's places that refer to the people as the house of God. Let's do Bridge on the River Choir. Da, 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 da. All right. So, we're going to pick up here tonight. <laughs> I didn't get it. I got to one verse what I was going to do this morning. You understand my heart? To tell people that you can live in sin and it's okay. Now they won't go out and say that. They will not come right out and say that. They'll just tell you that you're in the grace and it doesn't matter. And that if you're and if and whatever, you're just not looking at the Lord Jesus. You're not looking at the finished work of Jesus. Well, looking at the finished work of Jesus and and, and, and applying it are two th different things. Let me say something here. The finished work of Jesus has not finished your redemption in this present life. Oh boy, I just opened up a can of worms, didn't I? We have a promise. We have a seal of the Holy Ghost of the promised redemption of our bodies. That's not completed. On his side, it's completed as far as he's, did all the, he's done all that's necessary for it to be enacted, but the time of its activation has not taken place. For when he shall descend from heaven with the, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, then shall this corruptible put on incorruption, this mortal put on immortality. What's that tell me? It ain't completed for me in this life. I got to deal with my flesh. I got to deal with it every day. Paul said, I buffet it every day. You got to do something about your body. That's not legalism. That's staying free. That's staying delivered. Hello? 
We don't need to be living in the flesh one second and say, oh, praise God, I want to, you know, I'm going to testify, I'm going to wait, I'm going to prophesy, and then go out and get drunk. Paul makes a statement in talking about the grace of God. And he makes a statement. He says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And his, it's a rhetorical question. And his response to that rhetorical question, Paul used rhetoric oftentimes to make a point. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Kind of a sarcasm to it. You get it? What's his statement? It's two words. God forbid. We're not supposed to. We ought to be pleasing the Lord. That means you control your flesh. I got more scripture. We'll get, we'll get more time on, on to pleasing. Listen, I know these are, listen, this, these are tough. This is tough stuff. This isn't, you're under the blood, hallelujah. You can have what you say. Let's just sling some blood on that answer. Glory to God, you got it now, hallelujah. That's, that's more fun. That'd get them running and jumping. And I like to preach that stuff. I love to preach along those lines. But you know what? There's also stuff you got to teach in the Bible that keeps you straight. Like one preacher said, I don't care how high you jump as long as you walk straight when you come down. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. They shouting and jumping in church and then they walk right out there and they ain't walking too straight. Now you got to walk straight too. Because I'm going to tell you something. Your witness to the world is not determined by how high you jump in church. It's dep depending on how straight you walk out there with them. Now I'm going to share this on close. A pastor friend of mine and uh we're really, really a pastor. I know he's a pastor, but he's he's a relative of my pastor in Greenville, and that we know we know knew him. So we we weren't like spending a lot of time because he he kind of moved to that area after we left that area. But we know him, okay. But we've become Facebook friends, and uh, he posted the other day on Facebook. He said, "You know, I was sitting at a restaurant, and there was this lady sitting over there talking to these two other people, and she was railing against a couple of pastors in their town, just going off on them." This and that, talking about their families, talking about their kids and stuff. He said it took everything he had not to get up and say something. But what he did, he finally sat there and the, and the two people got up and left. Now, before they got up and left, she began to witness to him about coming to her church. He, and he got up finally. When they left, he got up and walked there and says, Ma'am, I just want you to know that the two ministers you were talking about and saying all those things about saying about the kids, I know them personally and none of the things you said are true. Of course, now by now, she's already swallowing hard. He said, I don't, I don't know how effective you think your witness was to sit and talk about them and invite them to church. And by the way, I'm a friend of your pastors, of your pastor. And I'd be very interested in, in, in seeing what he thought about what you just said. He said, all the color went right out of her face. You think those people could be interested in coming to the church? She all she did was sit there and talk about how bad the other pastors were and come to our church? Can't always agree, and listen, I, that's why I'm not. Call, I don't call names. When you're talking about something that's a doctrine that's going on in the church, you got to deal with the doctrine. But you, you don't have to hurt people. Yeah. You don't have to destroy people. Now, unless they're just blatantly false or whatever. I and mean, Paul did a couple times do that, but he, it was, those, are, those are extremes. Most of the time, he dealt with stuff generally. You know, he talked about uh, Hymes and uh, whoever the other guy was. I forgot his name. Yeah. Huh? Hymes yeah. and Alan. Yeah, whoever they are. Those guys. They're being shipwrecked, that kind of stuff. He, you know, he, uh, sometimes he would, but for the majority of the rule, he dealt with, what, in general. You have to deal with stuff in general, but you don't, you're, not trying to, you're not trying to destroy people. You're trying to protect the church from a teaching, not the people. Yeah. Okay? Because they, they can be, because if they, they recover <laughs> and get it all straightened out, then all right, praise the Lord. But then people won't forgive them because... <laughs> If you, if you got them bad, if you got really hating those people, then, you know, they can't ever recover in your mind. So, how high you jump in church, whether you prophesy in church, whether you gave a tongues and interpretation this morning, whether you had a word from the Lord that changed the whole direction of the ministry, which I doubt. Anyway, why? 
Because usually the pastor is going to tell the person running the ministry the change he's going to give them instead of having you prophesy to the church the change in the ministry. Usually. I'm not going to say God can't. But I, I, I've seen too many people try to change, run the churches through the gifts. And they're just using witchcraft. It ain't the Holy Ghost. They're prophesying in private meetings. The Lord has showed me that pastor's supposed to do this. We're going to start praying that he'll do this. And they begin to manipulate the realm of the Spirit. And it's not God. Just something they thought. They want to be, they want to be the big dog. I am the big dog. Ask all the kids at Westland. Ask Nathan. He'll tell you. And if he doesn't, I'll jump on him night while he's sleeping. I'll just run in his room and jump right and just land right on top of him in his bed. And he'll get up. You're the big dog because he won't be able to get up. <laughs> if he breathes down. <laughs> anyway, I'm trying to unhook. I'm trying to close this out. But I want you to understand my heart. My heart is not to put you in bondage or captivity. My heart is to keep you out of bondage and captivity. My heart is we walk according to the word, according to the scripture, and not according to something that makes you feel good. You're going to have to eat your green beans and your, Lord have mercy, we may have cooked a mess of collard yesterday. Mm, 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 mm. Mm. Hallelujah. Eat your collards. Going to have to eat your meat, you have to eat your vegetables, going to have to have all your different food sources, your grains. And in the church, you need all that. From the Word of God, you need all the different things. You need the full counsel of the Word of God. Not just the stuff that makes you feel good. It's easy to go where you feel good. We want people to feel good. I want people to succeed. That means you're going to have to have a renewing of the mind. You're going to have to keep your flesh under. You're going to have to walk according to the counsel of God's Word. And I'm going to tell you something. Renewing the mind and keeping your flesh under ain't always going to be pleasurable. Hello? I called Janie up. I know I'm closing. On my flight to Tulsa at the beginning of the month to go to the men's conference, I had a cougar in heat beside me. I'm telling you what's the truth. She was letting me know that she was in town for one night, was looking for a good time. And I'm, I'm like, I couldn't even look at her because she had her shirt was so low. I mean, I just, I mean, I actually, I'm sitting here talking straight ahead and the stewards comes up and wants to know what I need. I'm talking to her. But I'm talking like this. <laughs> like, dear Lord Jesus. I mean, like, are you kidding me? Like, like, well, did you follow up on it? No, the girls picked me up at the airport and took me to the apartment. It's like, dear Lord. Let me tell you something. The devil will present opportunities to you in life. You're going to have to keep your flesh under, and you're going to have to keep your mind renewed so that you always honor the Lord. And ministers are always running into stuff. Always, there's always some kind of temptation that the devil's trying to run your way. You've got to keep yourself pure. Amen. Amen? But you don't have to be a minister. You've got to keep yourself pure. Amen. Amen. Don't think it doesn't happen. I'm like, can she get any more blatant? I called my wife and told her. Actually, I got in the car with the girls. I said, I, you won't believe it. I mean, I, I go look in the mirror and say, I, I, you're a 54-year-old fat man. I was sent by the devil. You know, ain't because you're good looking. Ain't because you look like him. <laughs> Kevin about <Bader. laughs> I used to look kind of like that. But anyway, them days long been down the road. Hallelujah. When Dunlap set in. Chest and drawer set in. Hallelujah. 
Your belly done lapped over your belt and your chest done dropped into your drawers. I mean, those things have happened. That's why I wear a coat. <laughs> then some nights I wear a sweater. Hallelujah.